last 30 years, the forces of autocracy. The Russian army is committing barbaric actions. This is number six in our mini lectures on understanding the war. And we are 44 days into the war right now. And today is about China. Now, I've become an avid student of China, but I will under no circumstance say that I'm an expert on it. I've read a lot about Chinese history. I've read a lot about Chinese diplomacy uh, and also different types of popular books on China. And I must say that it is a fascinating country. China is obviously a country that knows its history and is aware of it, probably better than most of us. And that history is long, it is rich, and it is impressive. For my generation, China was sort of, you know, the odd man out in many ways. Uh, in the 1970s, you were wondering, okay, the Cultural Revolution was about to end, and then suddenly you see the opening of China, but it was still somehow backward. But I was always told as a youngster that, listen, the Chinese are extremely patient and for them one century is just a page uh, in history. And I think this is uh, the mentality that we should have when we deal with China. By way of introduction also, I think we should have a mentality of understanding that China is a merging superpower. It is the next big superpower, perhaps already there on three accounts. In other words, the economy, military, uh, and then demography. So China is a superpower with patience and one which we can see all around the world with a lot of influence at the moment. My three questions on China today is number one, what does China actually think about the war? Number two, what will China do during the war? And then number three, what might happen in the big picture in global politics with China? And I'll, of course, then draw a little bit of a conclusion. Uh, before I start, however, if I may recommend one person to follow on all things Chinese, that would be Rana Mitter, a professor at Oxford University, who in my mind uh, has a very sober view of what is going on in China, not least because he speaks the language fluently and is a student of the country. So here we go. Question number one, what does China think? Now, it's a big question to answer because of the population of the country. But I can only make reference to uh, President Xi Jinping, whom I've met actually twice. Uh, he was vice president at the time, but I met him in two one-on-one -on -one meetings. One in Beijing when I was foreign minister and the other one in Helsinki when I was foreign minister as well. Am I a mind reader? No, I'm not. But I do think that for President Xi Jinping at the moment, he's thinking that, hmm, this war is not exactly perfect in terms of timing because he and China needs to focus on two things. One is zero COVID policy, so keeping the lid over COVID. And two, why keep lid over COVID? Because it's a virus which is going to spread anyway. Well, because they're moving towards the big party Congress sometime in October, or November, where the president will most probably, most likely be crowned for his third term. So he at the moment wants to focus more on internal and domestic affairs rather than on foreign uh, affairs. Uh, and at the same time, he might be thinking though that, hmm, this could be a useful uh, distraction from the Chinese-US rivalry. Because remember that the United States has had one enemy uh, in the past few years and one target where there is cross-party support uh, in Congress uh, and in American politics, and that is China. And this is taking a little bit of 
pressure away from China because the United States has been so avidly focused, and correctly so, on the situation uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I think also that Xi Jinping might be thinking that you know, what we're seeing in Europe at the moment proves his case and point that democracy is an unstable form of, of government. At least he'll use it in that way in China. That Look, Ukraine wants to be a liberal democracy uh, and that has led to a war with, with Russia. Of course, you know, this is an interpretation which I don't necessarily share, but this could be the thinking uh, that he has. And that a little bit of instability in Europe is not necessarily a bad thing. So this is what I think that China thinks uh, at the moment. Probably much more complex than that, but on the surface uh, I think this explains some of the latest activity. This brings me to question number two. What will then China do in this situation? The way in which I see it is that China has three options. One, it pivots or leans towards Russia, basically supports Russia in a whole bunch of different ways. Two is that it leans and pivots towards the West, uh, Europe, especially Ukraine, uh, and, and perhaps even the US. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Moscow is more important than Kiev for uh, Xi Jinping. But the third way or third option for uh, China is to hover somewhere in between Russia and the West to basically oscillate on different areas and different fields in uh, its support. And my argument is that leaning towards Russia, China will do that in rhetoric. Leaning towards the West, China will do that in practice. But being neutral in this, I think, that will be the reality. So oscillating between the two on both issues. Uh, what do I mean by this? I mean by this to say that China is worried about two things. One is its reputation, and it could actually like to be seen as some kind of a peace mediator here. But two, it is seriously worried about secondary sanctions coming from the US or especially from Europe. And the figures that we look at are quite simple. Business and investment in Europe is 750 billion euros, right? 750 billion. Business with Russia is only 80 billion. And to be honest, 30 years ago, the Russian economy and the Chinese economy were of equal size. Now China is over 10 times bigger. So I'm not saying that Russia is a thorn in the Chinese economic side, but I'm saying is that banks, finance and business, it's much more important in the West than in Russia. This doesn't mean that China won't go in and take advantage of the situation and the sanctions that the West are posing. Yes, it will do that. That is absolutely sure. That, that's, what Russia, that's what China usually does. It'll basically create these dependencies but it will not throw out the Belt and Road Initiative, one of the biggest infrastructural economic initiatives that we've seen in recent times, uh, by risking itself uh, with uh, sanctions. So we have to be realistic about that. It'll exploit, but it does care about its reputation. Now, what does then this sort of, quote, friendship without limits mean? that we saw President Putin and, and President Xi Jinping talking about during the Olympics and that we've seen the foreign ministers of China and Russia talk about uh, ever since. I think it means less than you believe. It's a bit sort of realist school of thinking. So for China, it's more utilitarian, whereas for Russia, uh, it's more necessary. But it's not an alliance like, you know, NATO or the transatlantic alliance. It's not based on values. Uh, yeah, you know, both countries are rather autocratic in their, in their governance, 
but it, it's not sort of love lost. And, and, you know, when you talk to people in Beijing, uh, they still remember 1969 and the really difficult period in uh, Soviet-Chinese uh, relations. So uh, they haven't forgotten that time. Uh, and to be honest, I think the only thing that unites China and Russia at the moment is a common enemy, which I guess for Russia is more Europe, a little bit the US, whereas for China, it's more, uh, uh, it's more the US. My third question then today is that, okay, you know, uh, what, if we know what the Chinese are thinking, sort of, if we know that what China will do now in short term, what will happen in the long, long term? So what might happen is my third question. I think that China was actually quite surprised at the West's robust and united reaction. And it is now for the first time in a long time also assessing the role of the European Union more specifically. It knew what the US would do, but it probably never thought that the European Union would be so united on five waves of, of sanctions, on sending arms uh, to Ukraine, on rejecting its traditional, almost appeasing line with, with Russia. So I think Beijing at the moment is thinking that, hmm, perhaps the European Union is not only a regulatory superpower, which we have to live with in business, but it's also an acting superpower. And of course, then, when we talk about an acting superpower, we've seen how Europe reacted in, in the face of COVID, but more specifically, we're seeing how it acted on the basis of a common foreign security and even uh, a defense policy here. And it, China might be looking for individual European countries to, to play with. You know, it has this special forum with Central and Eastern European countries, the one from which Lithuania dropped out and then got scolded uh, by the Chinese. So it'll probably try to look for some allies here, but I'm not sure that, that China is going to find them because the European Union at the moment is so united uh, in its resolve against uh, uh, Russia. Of course, then you have you know, countries that are quite close to China, uh, for instance, Hungary, but, but it, it, it is starting to look at the EU more as a, as a package uh, and as a player. So from, again, a realist school of thinking, China might be thinking, well, how can we use the European Union as some kind of a player here in the rivalry between China and the US? Of course, now the transatlantic partnership is stronger than we've seen it for years. So this might also be careful. But I think that China is really assessing the way in which the European Union is working. Uh, the final point I want to make on what might happen is linked to Taiwan, which is sort of the big elephant in the room. Now, of course, China is thinking about Taiwan constantly. It's not a question about that. And it's not only you know, a question of semiconductors and, and the production thereof, but it's a broader question. And I might want to conclude that the war in Ukraine is not exactly uh, an incentive for a possible military takeover of Taiwan, not only because of geography and difficulty, but just because of the price of war. We can see that conventional war does not work. Uh, it leads not only to costs, to human life, to misery, to destruction, but it also leads to isolation. And China is looking very closely at what is happening at the moment to Russia, which at the end of this conflict will be completely isolated, um, politically, economically, financially, sport, um, culture, transport, uh, and also energy at the end of the day. So I think this war is a disincentive for any type of thinking uh, of, 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 of action in, in Taiwan. So let me then uh, conclude. A good friend of mine, I don't know if I'm allowed to reveal this, so I won't, but he has been mentioned in this lecture. He said that, hey, Alex, 
if you want to understand China, you need to read three things. You need to read Confucius on philosophy and religion, mentality basically. Secondly, you need to read Marx on communism. And thirdly, you need to read Schmidt on power. True or not, they're all good guiding lights for trying to understand China. But I would recommend all of us in the West to become students of China. If for nothing else, at least understanding what the next superpower of this world thinks and what it's all about. Uh, I also want to stress that you have to understand that the Chinese understand their history and their students of their history better than most of us. And it does have a lot of patience. It is not in a rush to do anything. Russia was in a rush to attack Ukraine because it understood that it's a superpower in decline. But China is a superpower on its way up and it has no hurry to do anything. Final piece of advice. Do not decouple from China. Do not cut China off. And this is not only about business and economics and finance and value chains and technology. You see, my argument is that even though Russia attacked Ukraine, it doesn't mean that dependence, interdependence and cooperation becomes something that causes conflict. Quite the contrary. I still think that cooperation and interdependence is a deterrent for conflict. So keep China in the loop, keep discussing, and at the same time, obviously, stay true to your values and be firm. Over the last 30 years, the forces of